we have uh, Bob Witten with us today, and he is a retired chemist, a hobbyist beekeeper, and uh, one of our master naturalists in our chapter. He's going to talk about the project that he's uh, sponsoring and working on to collect data, in particular about the, the pollinators in the pollinator garden at Pendapis Pond. Um, and also uh, to give us a little bit of a rundown on iNaturalist too. Am I right, Bob? Oh, uh, yes, that's it. All right, okay. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Let me... I stopped our video. Okay, apologize for the technical delay. Ah. Uh... The project I'm talking about today is entitled Pandapis Garden Pollinators. It's hosted on iNaturalist. And um, as you heard in the introduction, we're just trying to get information on which pollinators and beneficial insects are visiting which plants. For those of you that aren't familiar with iNaturalist, it's a combination identification tool, global database, and social media site for naturalists. Um, most recent stats I saw indicate that it's logged 124 million observations of over 400,000 species, and it's 5.9 million members. So it's a fairly good-sized operation. Um, if you're Uploading an observation to iNaturalist, um, they've got a pretty good AI system. Their computer vision will suggest a possible identification. And then you can either use that, uh, give it your own ID. And once you've entered the ID, then the observation is posted for the whole community of identifiers to review. And so you can get various people with expertise weighing in on your identification. Uh, when an observation has got two or more species level identifications um, that agree, then it's given research grade and passed on to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, where it's available to researchers around the world. And if you're interested, I recommend reading up on it on the iNaturalist.org website. Particular project that I'm working with um, can be found, it was entitled Pendapis Garden Pollinators. You can find it under the um, selecting projects from the community menu on the iNaturalist homepage, or um, just use this link directly. And we have this link posted at the Now, a brief overview of the project. If you navigate to the project, you'll see this page, um, letting you know that we currently have 143 observations of 57 species, 11 members, three of whom have contributed observations, most observed species, common Eastern bumblebee, Eastern tiger swallowtail, bicolored striped sweat bee, all pretty familiar insects. And if you scroll down past the map in the blog posts, you get to the list of observations, you get to the observations in um, chronological order, most recent first. And I'm hoping you can see my arrow here up at the top. There's a place you can click view all. And if you do that, you come up with a list view. And up top, You've got a search tool and a filter that you can use for selecting observations. And clicking on the filters brings up this window where you can see you have a whole lot of choices of ways to filter the information in a project. Um, it's really useful if you're going to have many hundreds or thousands of, of observations entered in your project. Uh, the field that I find most useful is the description slash tags field. See, so I've entered Bombus in here to see 
all of our bumblebee observations show up. And we've got 32 of them of five different species we've observed at the garden. Now, the really useful part of this for this project is if I enter a plant ID in here, um, in this case, I've entered goldenrods, and I come up with 11 observations of goldenrod featuring nine species of insects. And if you notice down here, we've got one outlier. It's the goldenrod soldier beetle, not actually on goldenrod, but we'll clean that up at some point. But we can go through the entire database, one plant, one flower at a time, and tabulate all of the insects that we've um, observed there, which is really getting to be interesting. If you want to participate in the project, um, you need an iNaturalist account first, then you can join the project and submit your observations of whatever insects or other arthropods of interest are observed within the bounds of the garden, which we're defining as just the garden beds and the lawn areas between the beds, tying it all together, um, not from the rest of the Pandapas Pond area. And if you observe an, organi uh, an organism on a plant, please add a tag identifying the plant because that's the whole purpose of the uh, project is to link the plants and the insects visiting them. Some of the results we've gotten so far, most observed insects, common eastern bumblebee, tiger swallowtail, bicolored striped sweat bee, uh, seven observations of each of those. Our top rated plants in terms of the variety of species they're attracting are mountain mint and goldenrods, no surprise there, I think to anyone. Iron weeds, world rousing weed, penstemon are fighting it out for third place. And Culver's root is down there in sixth place with six different species logged as visiting it. Mountain mint, there's just a, pictures of a few of our visitors. We've got uh, metallic green sweat bee. Uh, Lassia glossum sweat bee, this little black one here. A double banded scoliad wasp. It's some interesting wasps on the mountain mint and the goldenrod. Um, common eastern bumblebee down at the bottom left, great golden digger wasp, and finally in the bottom right, a, a uh, car large carpenter bee. Goldenrods, uh, we also get a nice array of bees and wasps. Um, top left, we've got a, a common eastern bumblebee, and then there's a uh, Mining bee in the genus Andrina, uh, Lassia glossum sweat bee, this one's the brown wing sweat bee. Bottom row, we've got our interesting wasps, the double banded scoliad wasp. In the middle, the two spotted scoliad wasp, um, which is just a gorgeous insect. And finally, the smiling mason wasp on the bottom right. And if you're wondering where the butterflies are, we've got them on the ironweeds, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, Sleepy Orange, Zabulon Skipper. Um, some interesting bees showed up on the ironweeds. Bottom left, we've got the Golden Northern Bumblebee. And in the, mid, in the bottom center, we've got the American Bumblebee, Bumble, Bombus Pennsylvanicus. Um, Somewhat similar markings, except the uh, American bumblebee is, is uh, more of a tannish yellow than the bright yellow of the golden northern, but they're both uh, experiencing a, a decrease in their range. So some people have them listed as um, species of some concern. And then on the bottom right, we've got a longhorn bee in the genus Melisodes which I've only seen so far on the ironweed. I don't know what else it visits. World rosin weed. Got a nice collection of bees, common Eastern bumblebee. Um, top right, we've got a sunflower resin bee. Um, bottom row, we've got the ubiquitous um, striped, striped uh, metallic green sweat bee. 
Uh, center, little black bee of some sort, could be a small carpenter bee, but I'm not sure. And then finally, a metallic green sweat bee, um, bottom right. Penstemon, everyone that works in the garden knows that the penstemon are just buzzing with bees whenever they're in bloom. Um, so I've got an entirely a selection of bees here. Once again, the common Eastern bumblebee starts us off on the top left. Top center, we've got something that looks like a bumblebee, but is not. It is an abrupt digger bee, Anthophora abrupta. And then top right, we've got a black and gold bumblebee. Bottom row, we've got some sort of leaf cutter bee uh, approaching a penstemon. And then uh, the again, the bicolor striped uh, sweat bee and a two-spotted bumblebee on the bottom right. Culver's root, it's an interesting collection of things on it. We've got uh, a butterfly, the silver-spotted skipper on the top row, and then an orange-tipped wood digger bee on top right. Um, bottom left, once again, the common eastern bumblebee, Found pretty much everywhere. Great golden digger wasp. And bottom right, a pair of gold barked thread waisted wasps. And the last two here are not on one of our species flowers that has a gets a lot of traffic, but paid a visit to Bill's um, hidden garden late in the season and found two very different bees visiting it. Um, common Eastern bumblebee, uh, big fat one had to fight her way into the flower, took all six legs to pry it open so she could get in. The other bee on it was the other end of the size spectrum, a uh, little helictus sweat bee that had plenty of room to just stroll on into the flower, wander around inside, no problems at all. Um, so it's kind of interesting just that we've got the both ends of the size range of the bees on that flower. Okay, now back to some instructions on how to enter your observations into the project. Um, this is my dashboard page for my iNaturalist account. If you open up your account, you'll see an upload button in green at the top. Pressing that gives you the page where you can drag over some photos to load them. Once you've loaded your photos, you can enter identification, uh, location, Pandapas Pond, and over here on the bottom left, I want to draw your attention to the field for tags and the field for projects. Those are the two that need to get filled out for the, this project. And on the left here, you see I've opened up the project box and Pandapis Garden Pollinators should be an available option if you join the project. Just click on that and then I've clicked up here on the tags and it gives me a space to enter the plant name, which in this case was Golden Alexanders. And once you have submitted your observation, the summary page will come up and just double check down here at the bottom right that you've got under projects, Pandapis garden pollinators and under tags, whatever plant ID you want. And you can add other tags as well, but just be sure and get the plant ID in there. And that is the rundown on the project. Um, hope some more of y'all will submit observations because there are a lot of things there we haven't observed yet, including whatever these two things are on the yarrow, looks like maybe some kind of beetle. Bob, um, I'm wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit. And how this... are there any questions? Yeah. Um, 
Bob, I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit how the data is going to be used and, and what the value of, of this kind of a project is. Uh, yeah, the data can be used, um, well, number one, to make decisions about planting in the garden. You know, if we know one particular species is getting uh, a whole bunch, a whole wide variety of insects, then we probably want to keep that or add to it. Whereas if you've got something that only one or two insects are visiting, it maybe is a pretty low impact plant, doesn't deserve quite as much space. And this is um, information that we can share with the public when we're trying to educate them on uh, planting pollinator gardens, recommend, you know, maybe just for a, a novice gardener, three or four of the most useful plants that will attract the biggest number of pollinators. Um, that's basically what we're looking for here. And it's just a lot of trying to figure out, well, you know, we've got this pollinator garden, what is it bringing in? You know, what are, what, what are, you know, what's using it? Okay, great. Uh, other questions? I'm sure other people have questions, comments about it. Bob, do you have suggestions for people who don't have cameras that like you do and Bruce does that, you know, are accustomed to taking really good insect pictures? Because I'm not 100% sure that um, I can get a good enough picture to get a good ID if, if it's a, an insect that I'm not familiar with. That's a challenge with um, basically anything small, um, a lot of the bees and even with a, a macro lens, it's hard to get a good ID on all the little tiny sweat bees and whatnot. Um, you know, larger things, the butterflies, the bumblebees and stuff, you can I've seen some pretty good pictures with phone cameras, depends on your phone. There are some clip on macro lenses for phone cameras. Um, I actually, I actually have one, a little macro clip on. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's called a macro knot. <laughs> yeah, and it's just going to be a matter of, of practice trying to get in close enough to the insects to, to get a decent shot with bees especially, but I think probably also um, beetles and maybe some of the flies. It's good to get multiple angles if you can. I mean, the, the instructions that I get for taking bee photos from the various projects like Bumblebee Watch are to get a shot of the face, a shot from the side, and the shot from above. Um, so multiple angles are really helpful on, um, you know, butterflies, you often don't need it if you can get all, if you can get the upper wing and the, and the lower wing and the underside. Um, but definitely with a lot of, with the bees and things like that, you want to get multiple angles. Well, on that bumblebee uh, iNaturalist site, they, I don't remember if it was on the site or if someone suggested it to me to take a little video and then look at it as a series of stills and you increase your odds of better photographs. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, I usually use burst mode on my uh, SLR. So I, same the thing, bottom, same it take, takes half a dozen photos and then I pick out the best one. Um, I'm really glad I'm not doing this with film. <laughs> but yeah, video, the video is a good suggestion. Then you can just pick out um, the best frames. Because it's really hard to get, get them to stay still enough to keep them in focus. So um, yeah, bunch of photos and, and take the best one. Bob, is a naturalist identifying the insect species for you or do you already know most of those um some a lot of the bee well some of the bees i can get the bumblebees i can get usually to species the other bees i can get a, some of them to genus level 
but I generally pick one taxonomic level above where I'm comfortable um, and enter that and then let the more expert people on iNatural. Bob, I have another question. I will, I will suggest um, entering anything to iNatural is put in some ID. Don't just leave it totally unknown. Um, okay. If you even just label it as an insect or a plant, something like that, then the people that do thousands of identifications will be automatically skimming through the database and they'll pick that up and somebody will change your plant to a flowering plant and someone else will put it in a genus and somebody else will add a species on it. If it's an unknown, it just sits in the pot. Last time I checked, there were like three or four million unknowns what? sitting there waiting for someone to sort through and say, well, that's a flowering plant or that's a, a butterfly or something. So put in some sort of ID that's, you know, even if it's just kind of general, just to get the ball rolling. So does the data officially get recorded? Uh, uh, well, does it have to be research grade before it can be officially recorded as part of your project or as soon as you enter it? Um, as soon as it get as soon as it gets entered, it shows up in the project. Okay. If you've you know um, selected the project when you entered the data, and if you take a close look through what we've got up there now, there are some things that are unknown. That are some things that are genus level, some family level. Um, and a couple of things, well, there's at least one butterfly that has disagreeing IDs on it. So if there's any expert on uh, fritillaries out there, I'd like to have someone take a look at that one. Okay. But yeah, it's it'll all show up there immediately. And then eventually it'll hopefully all get to at least a genus level identification. Okay, thank you. Bob, I have a question. Have you thought about also looking at not the number of species, but just the number of insects, you know, counting X, you know, X visits in say a 10 minute period or a five minute period um, for certain plants to see? I mean, you know, like the mountain mint, for example, can be just covered with yeah. thousands of insects. And just sheer, just sheer numbers. I'm wondering if you're thinking about that at all. Uh, that's a possibility. It's kind of a lot of work. Um, I participated last summer in a project like that that the USGS B Lab set up, where they were having people go out and monitor just one small area for bumblebees and identify all the flowers the bees were on, but also count the number of bees or estimate the number of bees on each type of flower and estimate the number of flowers. And it's, yeah, you've got to train some observers and then, you know, get them to go out and spend the time there actually doing the, counting the individuals. So it's, 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 it's certainly useful information, but it's, it's another level of effort. It wouldn't exactly dovetail with iNaturalist either. No, that's one that would probably have to be done independently. Yeah. I don't know right offhand how you could do that through an iNaturalist project. Well, I think they were, you know, that project over at the Turfgrass Center that was right in the front on Southgate. That's mm -hmm. what they were doing. They had plots mapped out and the, the grad student would come a certain number of times a week and sit in front of each plant and count count the the number of insects visiting, but I don't know if she was doing species identification or number, I, just the number. I don't know what they were doing. Yeah, it's kind of hard to ID and count everything. Like the USGS project was just bumblebees. So we typically see about five species around here. So the counting wasn't too bad, but if you get to count everything, then there's all those little tiny sweat bees and mining bees and little beetles and very size hoverflies and counting total number is doable. Counting each individual species is, is going to need a lot of labor. Um, 
if you've got a, several graduate students and a bunch of undergrad researchers to go sit around the bed and watch <laughs> it, that kind of works. But it, it would be interesting. I, I'm just not sure we can pull it off with the... Right. I agree. Uh, do you think uh, just being in the area and using a naturalist some of your ops an observation might automatically go to your project because I know that works at Falls Ridge. They've set up a project on you, iNaturalist. Yeah, um, you can define a place, capital P place on iNaturalist and all observations within that place go into the project that's linked to it. The problem is the Panapis Garden is too small. Okay. The uncertainty in your GPS on your phone or handheld device is great enough that it exceeds the bounds of the garden and therefore it won't be considered part of the place. Um, yeah, I, Don and I had a, a, our, a discussion about this over the summer and you know, I looked at it and it just isn't gonna work for a place as small as the garden. If you're gonna do the whole pond, yeah, but. Um, for us, it's it's you just need to join the project and and you know click on that tag. For each time, you have to remember each time that you want to make an entry. For so, each observation, okay. yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's a way you can make that the default on your account. I haven't wanted to do that, so I haven't looked at it, but that would be something worth worth looking at. If you know you're it's not going to be if you know you're not going to be making observations elsewhere. I, well, I I'm I think I, I guess I've just defaulted in my by using GPS because I haven't set up a project, but I try to do a lot with collecting species in my own garden. Mm -hmm. And I haven't made a project, but I guess I maybe I could, couldn't I? Make my garden a project. Uh you could. I'm not sure if that gets you much information unless other people are going to be oh, visiting yeah. your garden. Um, because I think you can do the same kind of information sorts just on your observations. Okay. Um, That's that was my real question was do I need to be a project to sort it out? Because I didn't know about that sort. Yeah, there, there's a whole lot of things on iNaturalist. I spent the summer trying to learn it and I'm nowhere clear, nowhere near having mastered it. It's just an amazingly complex tool, set of tools. But yeah, um, next time you're on your account and uh, you know on your dashboard where your observations are listed, um, look for that filter screen and and you should be able to filter your own observations just to I pick will. out the ones you want. Thank you. We had Benjamin's offer to share some tricks uh, with using an iPhone. Benjamin, do you have something you want to add at this time or another time? Um, I'm happy to add more another time. I think Bob covered a lot of really great things about uh, multiple angles for any of the insects. But the main problem with using a, a smartphone is that they're too smart and they're always trying to decide on the focus for you, which is, you know, is looking for a, a, a human face and there's no human face. So one, one, one thing I'd add quickly is that you can, for most of the phones, you can fix a focus. There's different ways to do it depending on what you have. But for the iPhone, for example, you can tap and hold a square in the scene and that'll fix the depth of focus or fix the the focal plane so uh i'll i'll do that before i try to point at um you know whatever insect i'm trying to capture because it won't stick around very long so if you can use a different target like a nearby flower to set your focus fix the focus so it can't change then it's easier to move the phone near the insect without it moving the focus all over the place and especially helpful if you zoom in first and do that. Thank you. Um, there was another comment in the chat on adding uh, uh, existing observations to the project. 
Um, and that can be done. I did that with 50 or 60 of my old observations when I set it up. It is, with a new observation, it's easier to add it to the project while you're entering the data to, set, to enter your observation. It's that's simpler than going back and uh, editing the observation to re-add it later. I wonder, Bob, if you could just mention again real quick, which um, plants, I know this is the very beginning of the project and there's a lot more to learn, but which plants so far seem to be getting the, the uh, biggest variety of uh, pollinators? Uh, well, it's right now a, a race between mountain mint and goldenrods. Um, we've got 11 species on mountain mint, 10 on the goldenrods. And I think it's probably mostly because I wasn't out there quite as much during the goldenrod bloom, but yeah, they, Right now, they're uh, looking like they get the, the greatest number of species, which, you know, if you've, if you've watched them in the garden, you can just kind of, you see so many things buzzing around, you, you assume that they're the ones that are attracting the most. Um, you know, the iron weeds, world rosin weed, penstemon, um, get a lot of traffic. Penstemon gets a lot of individuals, maybe not quite so many species. Um, But yeah, that's that's the top five um, so far. I mean, goldenrods and mountain mints are just are just fantastic pollinator plants. For There's a comment about being stung. Have you been stung very much? The only bees that have, well, let's see. Now, a few years ago, I haven't been stung working on this project. I've not been stung photographing bees. Um, a few years ago, a bumblebee stung me because it had perched on my shirt and I rather carelessly squeezed it with my arm. And it gave me a little sting to let me know it was there. And I, I lifted my arm, it flew off, and we were both apparently none the worse for the encounter. But no, I, I spend, you know, sometimes I'll spend 20 or 30 minutes uh, with a plant trying to, to get photos of close ups of, of a bee. And, you know, I get within a few inches of the bumblebees and they just ignore me. I'm just part of the landscape to them. <laughs> um, the only the only bees that ever sting me really are my honeybees, and that's because I go and mess with them and open their hives. The the wild bees, any any bees out foraging, just really don't care about you. Um, I've got a picture. I don't know. I probably didn't add it to the project, but I got a picture from the garden a few years ago of uh, a sweat bee on uh, Sharon's arm. It had landed in was getting a little salt lick and uh, was there long enough for me to come in and get a nice picture of it. But since um, since it wasn't actually on a plant species, I haven't added that one to the project, but um, maybe should make an exemption for insects on gardeners at the pollinator garden and add them. But, yeah, the, the bees are nothing, the foraging bees are nothing to be afraid of. They're, they're totally oblivious to you until you try and get a picture of them and they fly off. One year that there was a nest, I think on both sides and somebody accidentally stepped on them, of course, and they got stung. So you have to be careful if there's any ground nest in that. Yeah, those, well, the biggest problems with the yellow jackets, um, since they're social and form large colonies, they get defensive, just like the honeybees. But I haven't run into any issue with the ground nesting solitary bees, but I've heard one or two instances where, yeah, if you walk on them, get unhappy. But 
I, I haven't observed that high a concentration of them anywhere in my yard or around the garden. To, I mean, I'd love to see that many of them, but um, I, I'm not particularly worried about them. We did have a few years ago when I was working there, we did see black widow spiders. So they're there too. So just to be careful. Yeah, I would worry about those in the tool shed, um, mm -hmm. and all those stack pots and things. Um, we always have paper wasps in the tool shed, but the more I, more I learn about them, the, the less I think they're actually anything to worry about. Um, it's the yellow jackets that occasionally show up in the in the lawn that we need to do something with, or at least fence off so people can't get near them. Have you been working in the rain garden at all? Because that's one of the areas that I used to work in back in 2012, 2013. Oh, um, I... Didn't spend too much time in there pulling weeds this past summer. Um, there were a number of other people working. And so I managed to managed to kind of skip that, did a little mulch spreading, but the the rain garden is really looking nice Good. by the end of last year. Um, there, there's some nice some plants there that are very happy. That's where the, the biggest stand of the mountain mint is. I was getting most of the photo, mountain mint photos in that garden. Yeah, it's been changing over the years, I understand, too. The, the rushes mm -hmm. disappeared, and I had put um, touch-me-nots in there, but they were underneath the rushes, so I don't know if they ah. survived or not. So, um, What about the vines um, on the other side? Uh, are those worthwhile trying to look for pollinators there? You mean the native honeysuckle? Yeah, that row. I know the hummers like it. <laughs> I haven't, you know, the uh, hummingbirds love them, but um, I haven't run across too many of the insects, but I need to spend more time on the backside of the beds and I need to spend more time there in the afternoons. Um, found out in the summer, the afternoon population distribution looks somewhat different from the mornings when we're working. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, you know, I've made a concerted effort to look for pollinators on the nine bark and some of the other things, but um, I need to spend a little more time with uh, with the vines. Of course, the, even if we don't see any pollinators on the, or any adults on the, the cloud, well, I mean, the pipe vine is, is worth it just as a, as a post for the caterpillars haven't seen a caterpillar there. I've got caterpillar photos on the uh, spice bush of the swallowtails. And um, the some of the clear wings, like the snowberry clear wing uses the uh, Linistra sempervirens, the coral honeysuckle, and they're really hard to find. They blend in so well that you mm. can not realize they're there. And the aphids, um, are seem are used by other things, including the hummingbirds. But a lot of the songbirds will come in and eat the aphids on the mm. um, coral honeysuckle. And of course, ladybugs after the aphids. Any other uh, questions or comments about the project? Um, I, I see Barb there, Barb Walker. Hi, Barb. How, did, how, uh, how many volunteers did you have at the garden last year? Just uh, for maintenance. We have a great group of volunteers and lots of times we'll have uh, about 12 a week. You know, they, mm -hmm. they kind of come and go, vacations, bad knees, things like that. But um, 
Yeah, we, we gen, I, we, I would say we average 10 to 12 a week. But we could always use more. <laughs> well, I imagine that um, this kind of observation would go hand in hand with um, maintaining the gardens, but it's also, you could just go and just enjoy the gardens and take pictures while you're there. So it could be either way. Well, it makes it particularly interesting for those of us volunteering to see what Bob's doing. And, you know, for him to call attention to these different insects that he sees. And it's a, it's a reprieve from the weed pulling and we really enjoy that. So are we able to use uh, some of this iNaturalist work on this project as volunteer time? Sandy, yes. you're muted. Yes. Yes, it's it's a listed project. Okay. okay. Yes, it is time to thank Bob. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bob. I can't wait to get, I can't wait to come out and because I love photographing insects. They may not be the greatest photographs, but it's fun. And it does really bring bring sort of which plants are most important to support in the garden. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm I really out. like this. I like this observation project because I feel like it's something that we can all um, you know get get some useful information from, but also just really enjoy the beautiful garden and all the flowering plants kind of gives you another reason to get out there. So I, I thank you for putting this together. It's been great. Yay, Bob. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for listening to me about the project and hope uh, lots of people are submitting observations this spring. Yeah. So Bob, if people have questions, um, could they email you about the project if they're having questions with iNaturalist or anything else? Yes, definitely. Okay. <laughs>